All right, hello everyone. Welcome to my channel. My name is Thomas and I do educational materials. Uh, today is video number 107 on the reciprocal system of theory from Dewey B. Larson. Larson was a, an engineer that lived back in the 20th century. He started uh, having his first intuitions about the reciprocal system back in about 1990. And for the next 60 years of his life, up until his death, he worked on uh, those ideas, put out many, many books, even more articles. The basic idea behind the reciprocal system is that it is a theory of everything. If you learn how the reciprocal system works, you can plug it into any subject and uh, come up with uh, correct answers about that subject. Although it does take a little while to learn the theory, a longer than a little while, uh, you can uh, you can become fascinated by it pretty quickly and uh, highly motivated to learn it. And uh, then you can take off from there. Uh, so that's the idea behind uh, these videos is just to raise awareness about Larson because I actually, uh, in 20 years, 20 plus years of studying Larson, have never actually in the flesh met a person who's ever heard of it. But uh, there are people out there and many of them have helped me on my on my path, particularly Dr. Bruce Perrett, who passed away back in 2020. Never met him in the flesh, but uh, just from being on his um, his listserv and so on. Uh, several he had several listservs. Uh, now the gist of Larson's theory is that uh, it is a universe of motion. Uh, the universe is not made out of matter. It's not made out of energy. It is made out of motion. Motion, according to Larson, is the relationship between space and time. And space and time are reciprocals of each other in motion. And that's why he calls it the reciprocal system of theory. Space and time don't exist except for together in motion. Motion is a relationship between space and time. All kinds of motion are various relationships between space and time. And it can get kind of com complex because both space and time are uh, three or more dimensions. Uh, so, for example, matter in Larson's system is time to the third power over space to the third power. Pressure is time over space to the fourth power. Uh, a magnetic flux is time to the second power over space to the second power. Um, capacitance, uh, well, according to, this was a uh, some um, controversy, but according to Perrette, we'll say capacitance is S to the third power over T. Energy is T over S. As we know, uh, from more familiar relations, speed is space over time. Acceleration is space over time to the second power. Force is time over space to the second power. Uh, and on and on and on. And you can use these relations to check uh, equations, um, such as the um, uh, E equals MC squared. You can plug in E, T over S, m t to the third power over s to the third power speed of light squared that would be t to the second power over space to the second or uh, space to the second power over time to the second power so the equation works out if you do the math uh you can do that with other equations as well um uh, so anyway uh space and time both have three or more dimensions whatever adheres to one whatever quality adheres to one also adheres to the other uh where uh, space and time are uh, three or more dimensions. Larson calls that coordinate space and coordinate time. And then space and time are also progressing. They're always, time is always getting later and later. Space is always getting farther and farther apart. He calls that clock time and clock space, the progression of time and space. They also both come in only discrete units. They're not continuous, they're chunked. Uh, but those chunks are very, very, very small. So it looks continuous, but it isn't. One unit of space in one unit of time, that's speed, space over time. One unit of space in one unit of time is the speed of light. And the speed of light is not 
the maximum speed of the universe, as Einstein would have you believe, but it is the midpoint or the null point, the origin even, of the universe. And there is an entire half of the universe that's moving faster than the speed of light uh, that Larson calls sector two or the cosmic sector. And there is half of the universe that's moving slower than the speed of light that we're familiar with. That's Larson calls sector one or the material sector, which grows and aggregates through uh, through aggregation, bonding to its most complex level, which Larson says is DNA, which has uh, billions of atoms per molecule. The DNA molecule at that level becomes eligible to be controlled by a sector three, sector two entity. And that sector two entity combined with the sector one entity uh, creates what Larson calls the life unit. And so life is a combination of a material and cosmic sector Thing. And that uh, starts out as a single-celled organism, but it grows, it evolves, and develops up into its most complex level, which Larson says is the intelligent human being. At that point, the intelligent human being becomes eligible to be controlled overall by a, an entity from Sector 3. And Sector 3 is uh, what I would say is pointing at that speed of light region that is uh, the boundary between the material and cosmic sectors. Uh, other people would have called it uh, the religious or the numinous or god or goddesses or gods with a small, uh, small g even and um, the uh, spiritual world. And um, That sector three entity is always good and it is always correct. It communicates with the intelligent human being through various channels such as ESP, intuition, revelation, scientific insight. But uh, the human being being pretty much a uh, spiritual one-celled organism is uh, usually unable to decode those messages properly. Uh, through practice, the human being can become adept at that and then, uh, you know, uh, becomes what Larson calls level three. Uh, level three is a, um, a uh, intelligent human being uh, from sector two who comes under the uh, control or influence of sector three. And uh, so today we're uh, doing, I believe this is the 80, 85th video on his final book that is called Beyond Space and Time, which probes into this metaphysical region, Sector 3, and its ramifications. And uh, we're getting toward the end of the book in Chapter 26 that's called um, The Road Ahead. And uh, he's kind of comparing... Uh, religion and philosophy and what they have to contribute to the understanding of sector three. And so we will just start right here. Uh, the decline in the influence of the organized religions, especially in the Western nations, and the widespread repudiation of the religious standards of morality are generally interpreted as a major retreat in the continuing struggle to raise the moral level of the human race. Now, when Larson says moral, he's really referring to sector three. Ethical and moral. But, in fact, the present situation is a stage through which we must necessarily pass before the higher levels can be reached. The level of morality from which the drop has occurred was not an expression of the morality of the human race. It was an expression of the moral standards of the most advanced religious thinkers, standards that the general public were not prepared to accept voluntarily, but to which they were induced to conform by threats of punishment or promises of reward, either here or in the hereafter. Okay, so what he's talking about is like, you know, uh, the Christian church, Catholic church, or uh, even the, uh, the Jewish authorities um, basically forcing us into conformity with these religions, uh, even against our will. Um, and so 
we have to, uh, you know, we have to do it voluntarily. We have to, um, you know, accept the moral code uh, or at least develop our own moral code voluntarily, not through threats of punishment. Okay, back to Larson. Organized society is concerned primarily with what its members do rather than why they do it. An, and an enforced code serves the purpose of society. But as pointed out, the purpose for which the universe exists, so far as we are able to discern it, is to develop individuals who are fully under the control of the Sector 3 aspects of their personalities. Before this can be accomplished, the individual members of society must be released from control by the carrot and the stick, and allowed to make their own choices. The first result of such a release naturally takes the form of a general deterioration of the prevailing morality, inasmuch as the general average of the individual moral standards cannot be expected to measure up to the level previously established on the basis of the most advanced moral thinking. But the release from authority is essential, and even though the initial retrogression that follows this release is distressing, this is part of the price of progress. So, uh, he gets into some dangerous language there with the price of progress and things like that. But basically what he's saying is that, um, you know, uh, when people are given, uh, you know, the independence to choose their own uh, religion and moral authority, they uh, may backslide. Uh, they, they, it may look like they're backsliding um, for a while but then uh, they will eventually kind of wake up and get up to speed and realize that this is their responsibility. Um, that is uh, an argument that probably most uh, conservative religious people uh, reject because, you know, they always talk about all the chaos that will ensue, you know, if, uh, if this or that happens. And Larson is just saying, well, the, the chaos is kind of inevitable. Uh, we have to go through that stage, uh, but we will come out the other side. And that is very similar, I think, to what is happening in a lot uh, um, today in a uh, large amount. Okay, back to Larson. In the long run, the deterioration of the position of institutional religion that is now taking place in the Western world, grim as it may seem to the Orthodox religious establishment, may have a beneficial effect in forcing these organizations to reassess their policies. We may hope, for instance, that at least some of the religious bodies will take note of the need for growth in moral understanding, something comparable to the growth that has occurred in scientific knowledge. None of the world religions, says L. L. White, has adequately recognized the supreme importance of this human faculty for progressive discovery. Science, too, has its unproductive periods when knowledge stands still or even retrogresses, and it is often handicapped by undue reliance on the dicta of authorities. But in principle, it is open-minded. The word of authority may, for a time, be accepted de facto, but never de jure. Sooner or later, therefore, the search for truth is resumed and more progress ensues. Religious thinking could, be, could very profitably take heed of this scientific experience. Of course, those who feel that all that needs to be said about philosophical and religious matters has already been said by the founders of the great religions, more particularly by the founder of their own religion, will reject any such suggestion summarily. But it is now apparent that the purely authoritarian basis for religion, however necessary it may have been originally, and however great its contribution to past progress may have been, is wholly inadequate to deal with the questions that are being asked by the growing number of individuals who are doing their own thinking and who want to put their religious beliefs on a rational basis. A major reason for the valuelessness 
which is the occasion for so much concern at present, is that much of the traditional value structure has been based on the metaphysical assertions of religion, which are today weakening under severe attack. Now that the results of the present study have reaffirmed and reinforced some of the most important of these metaphysical assertions and have provided a sound scientific basis for the moral code, totally independent of religious authority, although entirely consistent with the existence of such authority. The weakness that is responsible for the lack of a validated, usable system of values has been overcome. The way is now open for a resumption of the forward progress that was interrupted when the authoritarian controls were first relaxed. It is no longer necessary to define the moral code by religious decree. We now have the ability to derive the provisions of the code independently of any authority, even if we do not if we, even if we do recognize a religious authority of some kind. And I think that that phrase there really sums up Larson's whole contribution to science and religion is that we now have the ability to derive the provisions of the code independently of any authority. It is now in our hands. We have the vehicle. The reciprocal system is the vehicle that we can use to come up with this stuff for ourselves. We do not have to depend on the guys in the white lab coats. We don't have to rely on the eggheads in the ivory tower. And we don't have to, you know, uh, rely on the pointy heads in the, uh, in the church. You know, we can, we, we have the ability to do this ourselves. Um, and like Larson said, it may take a, it may cause a little backsliding for a second, um, but in the long run, that's what we need to do. And just like anything else, anything else uh, in terms of growth and maturity, you know, uh, when you give your child a little bit more independence, they may they may abuse it for a second, you know, but eventually that's what they need to do, you you know. Th they need to learn their lessons the hard way and then, you know, and then they'll be better off for it. Just, you know, my uh, opinion there. Uh, but back to Larson. Just what form future progress toward the objectives of human existence will take remains to be seen. In the short run situation, the established religions will play the principal role. Over the long pull, there may be some significant changes. As pointed out in the discussion of scientific insight, the information that can be derived from intuitive sources depends not only on the capability of the human individual to receive such information, but also on the amount of existing knowledge to which the intuitive information can be related. In the words of the previous discussion, it depends on the height of the platform from which the inductive leap is made. The continual increase in religious, that is metaphysical, knowledge, a process that will be accelerated when full advantage is taken of the findings of this work, should therefore bring a significant amount of additional intuitive information within reach. Under these circumstances, it is quite possible that some especially qualified individual may receive religious revelations of such a nature as to, lead, as to lead to establishment of a new religion or drastic reconstruction of some religion now existing. Either in connection with such developments or independent of them, there may be some major changes in the structure and policies of religious organizations in general. For the immediate future, however, we will have to rely mainly on the efforts of the established religions. In the light of the information that has been developed in the preceding pages, it is clear that the task to be accomplished calls for religious organizations that have a strong sense of purpose, together with an up-to-date, enlightened viewpoint on genuine religious issues, as matters now stand, however, most of the religious organizations that follow a well-defined path 
are badly encumbered with archaic beliefs and doctrines, while those that have made some efforts to keep abreast of modern thought have, to a large extent, lost their sense of purpose and are floundering about without any clear-cut religious objectives. Such an assertion, coming as it does from a scientific rather than a religious source, may be challenged and probably resented as well. But current issues of religious journals are full of statements by members of the religious establishment that say essentially the same thing. Here, for instance, are the views of a minister of one of the large Protestant denominations. Uh, and here's a quote from that person. Across the entire country, there is a deep uneasiness about the message and the mission of the Christian church. First, there is the current turmoil in theology and worship. Just when the church seemed to be the one place left where a person could be sure of finding ancient truths and moral standards reaffirmed, suddenly everything seems to be called into question. The uneasiness has been compounded by the emergence of the clergy as questioners and innovators. If you add to that the trend toward political activism and the rejection of traditional piety, what I might call the theology of the picket line, then no one can speak of sanctuaries today as havens of peace in a world of tumultuous change. Okay, that will uh, end it for today. Uh, tune in tomorrow and uh, we will move on with this chapter. Um, Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.